Good morning. All right, is this, is this, I gotta get this in a good spot. Ah, welcome, welcome to First United Methodist Church, the seventh Sunday after Pentecost. We are a reconciling congregation open to all, and all means all when you're here. I appreciate the folks that are here by Facebook and Zoom and the faithful remnant that came into this hot church building today. And um, we don't think it's that hot. Well, <laughs> it's biblical, Margaret. The faithful remnant is biblical. <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna begin the service with silent prayer and then we'll enjoy John's prelude. Please be in an attitude of prayer. Beautiful. Now, if you're comfortable and able to do so, please stand for the call to worship and then for the first hymn. This is the day the Lord has made. Black hymnal 2236, gather us in, the faith we sing.
please join me in the unison opening prayer. God of justice, your word is light and truth. Let your face shine on us to restore us, that we may walk in your way, seeking justice and doing good. Amen. Now, please share the peace of Christ with someone near you safely. Depends on the person as you are comfortable. <laughs> okay, well, next is the Hebrew scripture, which I think Randy will supply. The Hebrew scripture comes from Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 through 32. Then the Lord said, how great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah and how very grave their sin. I must go down and see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went toward Sodom while Abraham remained standing before the Lord. Then Abraham came near and said, will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city Will you then sweep away the place and not forgive it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to slay the righteous with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered, Let me take it upon myself to speak to my Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the 50 righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find 45 there. Again, he spoke to him. Suppose 40 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 40, I will not do it. Then he said, oh, do not let my Lord be angry if I speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, let me take it upon myself to speak to my Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, oh, do not let my Lord be angry if I speak just once more. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, for the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. Our reader was Mary Constantine. She tape recorded it. And our next hymn is 2172 in the faith we sing, We Are Called.
please remain standing if you're comfortable doing it um, for the reading of the gospel rule. It's short. The gospel reading comes from Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4. Please stand if you're able. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, may your name be revered as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial. Thanks be to God. You may be seated, except for me. Now in the Old Testament this morning, Abraham is attempting to change God's mind, which got me thinking, do I think God can be persuaded to change God's mind? Do you? Seems like we tend to try over the course of our lives, like, God, if you will help me pass this math test, I promise to be a better kid and keep my room clean and stop arguing with my mother. Sometimes our relationship with God can sound a bit like a child's relationship with Santa Claus. Please, Santa, all I really want is the self-driving Barbie Roadster and I'm being so good, so you can be good to me and make sure my Barbie can get around in style. I mean, that neat little Barbie sports car was the bomb. It was a miracle of early 1960s technology. It could carry Barbie from under the Christmas tree all the way across the living room, self-driving. How cool is that? And I was good. And Santa did keep his side of the bargain. And there it was, Barbie's dream car. And I put Barbie in the driver's seat and prepared to launch her. And my big brother, Bruce, said, let me see that thing. Grabbed it out of my hands and began winding it. And winding and winding and winding until sprawling. The self-driving mechanism was kaput. And there Barbie sat, immobile. Sometimes God and Santa have a sense of humor. Now in June, in one of our Digging Deeper classes, Pastor Marty asked us if we had grown up with the image of God as an old white bearded man. At the time we were thinking Charlton Heston in the Ten Commandments. Moses looks sort of like God. But it occurred to me during my summer musings that maybe how us kids got the image of God as an old white bearded man was because of Santa. Santa certainly seemed more real to us than God. Now, when I was a little kid, I had a best friend named Cindy, from whom I was inseparable. Cindy had a wonderful family who were devout Presbyterians. And my first exposure to organized religion came with Cindy's family at the Presbyterian Christmas Potluck and Carol Sing. It was a magical evening for me. Wonderful food being passed down long tables in Fellowship Hall, and a small gift for every child who was there, even, Cindy assured me, the non-Presbyterians. Because I knew I was Methodist, my parents had told me so, although I don't remember attending here much. But oh, those glorious little Presbyterian Christmas gifts. One year, I got a little picture of Jesus, blonde and blue-eyed, staring soulfully into the distance. You probably know the picture. And I proudly placed this kind-looking Caucasian man proudly on my bedstand. Another year, I got the coolest little neon green plastic nativity. It had Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, 
neon green, and it actually glowed in the dark. How cool is that? I had never seen anything so wonderful, except maybe the Barbie self-driving roadster. The Holy Family proudly glowed beside my bedstand next to blonde Jesus for many years. I share these stories mostly to illustrate how confusing Christianity can seem to little kids. There's God and baby Jesus and grown up Jesus. And there's Santa Claus, who's also St. Nicholas. And except for the baby Jesus, God always seems to have a beard. So I've shared before that when the Methodists gave out the Bibles to the third graders, my mom was motivated to haul me down here to the Coke room to the little Bible giving ceremony. I now had my very own revised standard version. Being a voracious reader, I dug in. There was really some wonderful stuff in there. There was also some really disturbing stuff too. If you continue reading today's Genesis passage about Abraham negotiating to save Sodom and go through the entire story of Lot, there is plenty to be disturbed by. So I discerned early that I should focus on the Gospels and leave the Old Testament for a more mature mind than mine. Elementary school had not equipped me for some of those Old Testament tales. But I did remain intrigued by the big questions of the nature of God and Jesus and humanity, and eventually found myself studying at Colgate University. I majored in religion. It was a wonderful education. All the latest mid-1970s biblical scholarship. I ate it up, even the Old Testament class. And somehow along the way, I lost my faith. By that, I mean I lost the childlike wonder at the awesomeness of the glow-in-the-dark Jesus and the warmth of a fellowship of well-fed Presbyterians singing, you better watch out, you better not cry, and then singing Silent Night, both with equal gusto. So, okay, fast forward to the late 1980s when my husband Bruce insisted we go back to our roots in Methodism. His roots were definitely deeper than mine. And we joined a congregation of faith and doubt, committed to social justice and metaphorically lighting a candle in a dark world. I found here the spark of the Holy Spirit that I felt in that Presbyterian carol sing of shared humanity and shared meals and kids surrounded by a veritable village of loving parents, grandparents, aunts, and uncles. I found some great kids to whom I am no blood relation, but who call me Aunt Allison to this day. I found a community that nurtured my gifts, forgave my foibles, tolerated my idiosyncrasies, and even offered me the opportunity to ramble random theological deep thoughts from the pulpit occasionally. And over time, I learned to keep my faith simple. That one, I learned mostly from the theologian Brian McLaren. He described the evolution of spiritual maturity as this, simplicity, complexity, perplexity, humility. Neon green baby Jesus gave me warm fuzzies when I was little. Simplicity. Then I got my Bible and read some stuff that I was sure I would understand better when I was older. Studying at Colgate, I got deep into academic understandings of the complex compilation that is our Holy Bible. And I got perplexed. What parts were history? What parts poetry? 
what parts were universal truths? And when I came to this church, where I was told it was okay to have both faith and doubt, I found a home to help me learn the essence of mature faith, humility. I don't have to have the answers to the big questions. I can admit like Job did after asking God to explain the nature of the universe, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. All I really need to do is do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with my God. And yet there's still a little inner voice that nags me. What if I've got it all wrong? Humanity has always wanted to find the right words to sway God into our way of thinking. That's why folks ask the great Rabbi Jesus of Nazareth for the right way to pray. The prayer is in two Gospels, today's Luke and the somewhat more familiar Matthew. But essentially, Jesus said, keep it simple. Pray sort of like this. Loving parent, you are awesome. May your love take root in our world. Help us meet our daily needs. Forgive us when we screw up and help us to also be forgiving. May we face the world, come what may, equipped with your love. Amen. Now I'm to uh, thank everybody for their offerings and their tithes. Remind you that there's many ways of doing that. Drop them off here, do it through what else, tithely and all kinds of things. But I, I can't keep track of all that. So you'll see it on your screen, you guys that are home. You guys that are here, you already did this. So thank you very much. And we <sighs> wanna dedicate these things to a loving God who knows better than we do what we should be doing with them. So we pray and we do mission as we are so led. Thank you, God. Amen. Now we have joys and concerns. I ask you to review the people on the prayer list. And I do have an announcement, which is kind of hard for us. Uh, we have lost a pillar matriarch of our church. Um, Millie Parrish passed away peacefully. Um, was it Saturday morning uh, of a massive stroke? Hmm? Thursday night. Well, I didn't hear until Saturday morning, so it didn't. It wasn't real to me until Saturday morning. But thank you, Dave. Uh, peaceful, which is what everybody wants. Not long lingering and Lori Wolverton see her would see her all the time and she said well the last time i was there was a couple days before and she was still giving me orders <laughs> so millie was millie right to the last and for that we are grateful and we'll know more about arrangements as time goes on when pastor marty gets back we also want to continue to remember lucille wiggin on the death of her husband leon and president joe biden recovering from covid and everybody else who's recovering from COVID and will be recovering from COVID and the survivors of people who did not make it through COVID, of which Bruce and I know several, unfortunately. Um, any other? Oh, of course. Well, John's not going to say it. I will keep praying for Scott Amundsen, who's still in the hospital. Still there, doing better, right? We do have a diagnosis. Uh, it is hydrocephalus, uh, normal pressure hydrocephalus, NPH. And this was after several, several different tests and trial and error of trying different things. So we finally found out what it was. He did have a lumbar puncture. Um, and all the test results of that, uh, all the stuff was clear. Um, he's back to his old cantankerous self 
complaining about nurses, complaining about this, that, and the other. And you? Is he and complaining about you? No, he just wants to get out of there. So. Uh, he may be released tomorrow, um, going into um, uh, rehab for a few days before he can come home. But uh, he's uh, otherwise he's fine. We have a appointment with the neurosurgeon about putting a shunt in, and that's where we are. So he's doing much better. Thanks, Bruce, for reminding me. <laughs> uh, anybody else want to raise anybody? No? Okay, well, let's be in prayer for us and the world. Gracious, gracious, loving God, we have a lot of people we're worried about, people who are grieving, people who are ill, people who are feeling really uncertain in today's world. We ask that you read our hearts and address our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, we're grateful for summer, even though it's been pretty hot. Um, <laughs> come this winter, when we're complaining about ice and snow, we'll all be reminding each other about today and uh, I'm grateful that we had our electricity restored after many hours yesterday and so I finally got a few hours of sleep because of the air conditioning finally being back on which makes me think about all the people that don't have air conditioning or fans or electricity people across the entire world are dealing with this horrible heat except for the ones that are having uh, snowstorms in May. Lord, we pray for our planet and for our leaders to start to address climate change. Lord, in your mercy, in our prayer. Creator God, you call us to love and serve you with body, mind, and spirit through loving your creation and our brothers and sisters. Open our hearts in compassion and receive these petitions on behalf of the church and the world. And now, as your children, we keep it simple and pray, our creator, redeemer, sustainer, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The closing hymn is in an insert. Tis the gift to be simple.
just a few closing announcements. Um, we are picnicking in the park on August 21st. Our hostess with the mostest, Laura Hurley, is here. So uh, <laughs> make sure you RSVP so we have enough hot dogs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let's see. Pastor Marty will be get back on Tuesday and we'll be continuing campfires in the courtyard. July 31st, August 14th and 28th, making s'mores and singing and hanging out and you're welcome to bring your kids and your dogs and whatever makes you happy. They also are doing some playgroups in the park. Pastor Marty will tell you more about that, I'm sure, when she's back. I think that's it for announcements, unless Margaret knows something or John. Okay, well then, uh, hmm? later, later. There is no later for these folks, this is it. All right, now where am I? I've lost my place. I think we're done. Oh, blessing, yes. Bless you for coming in this hot day and dealing with my sleep deprived, fried brain. But it is always a blessing to see friendly faces. Amen. Now we'll be seated and enjoy the post.